Hi, everybody. Very excited to be here to talk about the future of investment in AI. And maybe to jump in the future, let's get back to recent past. And uh, I will ask our panelists to talk a few words about their last investment linked to AI and what the company is actually doing. So I'm trying to think of our most recent announced investment. With First Minute, we just announced an investment in a company called Agile Analog, who are uh, building uh, uh, chips for, uh, sorry, an automated process for laying out analog um, uh, chip components. Very interesting company based in Cambridge. Our latest investment in AI is a robotics company called uh, Exotech. Also, actually, the most recent one is uh, BrainCube, which brings uh, AI to automating the industrial uh, chain uh, automation to the next level. Good morning. Um, so I guess I would have to name them all, because is there a new company out there that doesn't put AI in their slides anymore? which is fundamentally an issue, but, but uh, more seriously, we've made some recent investments both in hardware and software and cybersecurity that leverage uh, machine learning and AI. Talking about AI first companies only, is that, uh, is that the rule? Yeah. Uh, I think our l two last investment in, uh, in AI, one was in legal tech, a company called Hyperlex, uh, able to extract data from contracts. And uh, the second one is Datadome, uh, doing bot detection on the web, so meaning uh, active in the cybersecurity space. All right. As Reza just told, everybody's talking about AI. A few years ago, everybody was talking about big data. Is AI, uh, is AI a buzzword, or is it actually at the heart of your investment thesis? Excellent question. Um, I think, yes, it is a buzzword. I think it's uh, the uh, one of the... Uh, uh, chief scientist, uh, the chief scientist at uh, at Founders Funds um, has this great claim that 15 years ago everybody was called a statistician, and then they decided that was boring, so they renamed themselves data scientists, and then that was boring, so they renamed named themselves machine learners, and that was boring, so now they renamed themselves uh, um, AI practitioners. All of that is sort of true, and there is a lot of hype. At the same time, I think there is a real thing that has happened over the last five years, or a, se a series of interlocking real things that's happened. One is the availability of compute at enormous scale. That's probably the most important thing, and low cost. Um, a commodity compute, uh, huge availabilities of data in all kinds of enterprises, and some significant algorithmic developments, although perhaps that's less important than the other two um, uh, over the last five years, which means now that there are uh, there is a platform and there is a set of tooling um, which is having an impact on a very large, in fact, on all of industry. And so in every sector, we're seeing opportunities to use those trends for disruption, which makes it a very interesting time for investing. Um, whether you call that AI or not, I don't know. I think in some ways it's just the next evolution of software eating the world. Julien David? I think it was an investment thesis three or four years ago when you started seeing the first movers. Uh, we did shift. It was insurance. People had commonalities in data. You were bringing the latest of machine learning. It made sense. Today, I think it's either a specifics, typically in hardware, when you do chipset, when you have like tools that will provide further capacities to enable, to accelerate machine learning or deep learning. I think it is what code used to be 10 years ago, meaning that now you want to launch a startup, you need to be able to produce algorithm. You need to be able to machine learn on the stack of data that you're going to get provided. The issue being, how much of the data do you have? And I think it becomes a buzzword when everybody puts it in their slides. Um, so actually, I'm, I'm very much aligned with what Steve mentioned, because I think that um, the, the availability or, of, or and the cheap price of compute uh, makes it much easier for people to actually start applying mathematical models to problems. Um, so it's super interesting from a trend perspective when they're able to solve problems that we thought would not be possible to be made more efficient because there was not enough compute, it was too expensive. So that's really the interesting part for me is, what are you using these models for, and how much of a previously known pain are you solving now, and at what cost? And, and that makes it much more uh, interesting as an investor. Uh, I mentioned the uh, AI first uh, kind of companies. You know, the, the, the first company we invested in, uh, which can be an AI first company, is Tiny Clues. And I, I'm not sure. It was in 2013, so five years ago. I'm not sure we were talking uh, about artificial intelligence. We were probably talking about uh, big data for predictive marketing, and that was it. But the reality is it, that it, it was an AI-first company, and David, uh, the CEO, wrote a nice paper on, uh, on, uh, on LinkedIn, I think, about this, meaning that you have a product that is somehow magic, 
that will probably disrupt the way people do things. And uh, the big issue is what will be the, the adoption rate of this? How will you market this? How will you make that acceptable to people? Because it's very different from uh, pure rule-based uh, marketing tools, if I take this example. And, and I think as VCs, you know, we, when, you look at, when we look at, uh, at companies, we look at the product, its capabilities, uh, it's the fact that it's new, that it's more productive or cheaper or faster, whatever. But we need also to think about go-to-market and the way industries will, uh, will add up stuff. And uh, if I look at our portfolio, marketing, advertising, that's a given, you know, they, they, they have adopted that. Cybersecurity is probably adopting it massively. But if, if I look at uh, companies in the medical space, for example, we, together with Spartec, we are in cardiologues. I see things moving forward so slowly, you know, because obviously it's very different to say that it's a SaaS company that will enable the diagnosis on heart disease than a medical uh, doctor. That's very interesting, and, for, and I think for us it's a big challenge because we can't be expert in all sectors and understand all the value chains of all the markets. And we probably need to partner with, uh, with uh, as digital VCs, I would say IT VCs, we probably need to, partners with, to partner with, uh, with others. Steve? I, yeah, I think this is a super important point. I've, I very much agree. I think that uh, go-to-market really dominates you know, investability in this space, go-to-market and brand. Uh, and the development of brand. Ironically, um, the development of AI is making that more important than it was ever before, because actually the underlying algorithmic te te techniques, the time to commoditize the techniques is getting shorter and shorter and shorter, partly because everybody publishes everything. So today's breakthrough is next year's open source project and is the year after everybody's adopted it. And so I think that the thing that really abs absolutely dominates success is do you really understand how to sell to this market? And where in the value chain are you going to intervene? How are you going to build a brand? What is the real problem that you're going to solve for this industry? Jason Kalkanis has this quote from a few years ago, which I paraphrase sometimes, which is, don't build AI for somebody else, else's ecosystem. Build your own ecosystem and use AI to defend it. And I think that's the right way to do, think about things. It's actually even more than that, because basically it's machine learning. So basically you need a stack of data. So you need a vertical. So basically the moment, I mean, the past five years have been about digitalization, connectivity within machines, within cardio uh, uh, tools. So basically now we have sets of data, and when you see commonality in data and data aggregating is where you can bring machine learning. There's always a distinction between machine learning, we provide algorithmic tools, deep learning libraries are available, but it comes down to having verticals that emerge where data is becoming huge. Right, so, so just I want to add to that because I think there's a human aspect that, 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 that I want to also reinforce because I tend to think that people publish everything, so kind of the models are becoming, it's the open source piece, the data is the proprietary piece, and that's where you can actually provide value. But I think one of the things I've noted is, you know, in the sectors when Jean-David talks about marketing or ad tech, you know, if your AI model fails, no one's going to die. And that's actually an important point is, you know, if Amazon recommends a book to you based on your browsing or does Netflix and you don't buy the book or you don't watch the movie, well, so what? But, you know, but if someone feels that if the math model of Cardiolux fails and someone dies, you're not going to adopt it as much. And, and one of the things I'm seeing is in areas where today there's just no risk and if it fails, nothing bad happens, but if it works, you get extra revenue, adoption is much faster. But if people have the perception that something bad can happen, they're still not comfortable, and those adoption times are being much longer. Getting back to our core topic, trends, uh, in terms of recent deal, feel, deal flow or recent uh, investment, um, where are the, the fields in AI, such as vertical, you already gave a few information about that, uh, hardware, uh, maybe chips, I know that uh, Steve has uh, something to tell us about that, where you have seen like the, the most uh, interesting trends in the um, recent past. Uh, sure, well maybe I'll just, uh, I think there's a variety of areas, but maybe I'll just touch on chipsets yeah. as, as a particular area. Atomico, obviously an investor in GraphCore, which we're very excited about. Um, more generally, I think it's a very productive time at the moment in alternative chipset architectures. There's a lot of experimentation going on. There's been a parallel set of developments that have happened over the last 15 years in that world, which means it's now much cheaper to get to market with a new design than it was 
before. You can get you can do uh, a lot of proof of concept on FPGAs at low cost. You can also get runs of actual chips done for you know reasonable investable costs rather than for tens to hundreds of millions of dollars. And so that compounding effect of the underlying tool chain means that there's a lot of experimentation going on. And at the same time, the algorithmic developments that we've happened, had over the last five to 10 years mean that if you can put those developments into hardware or if you can design hardware that is more appropriate for a particular algorithm or for a particular algorithmic approach, you can get a significant edge in terms of performance. There's a lot of incentive to invest. Um, and so I think it's a, very, it's a very productive area at the moment. Jean-David, you told me about your belief uh, that uh, investing in full tax solution is, uh, can be key. You know, it, it, it depends uh, who you are as a VC, but uh, uh, ESAI uh, basically manage small funds and uh, we invest relatively early. So it means that the initial uh, capital intensity of the place we are backing obviously is important. We think the best route for us is to invest in full stack solution, bringing, you know, a clear business benefit, either its productivity or its uh, top line improvement for one vertical or one uh, uh, one use case, basically. And in that case, you know, the value of the play is probably not in the AI capabilities per se, but more in the fact that you integrate smoothly uh, sector knowledge, AI, data collection, and all of that kind of stuff. So that's basically the, the, the kind of play we can back. Talking about trends is very difficult. When you are early, if the trends are obvious, it means that it's too late. So basically what we try to see is people doing the kind of play I'm describing in fields we don't know a lot about, but uh, in which we think, well, that could make sense. Let's, let's, let's bet on that. And in that case, co-investors can be key also. We we're talking about the, the go-to-market. Yeah, yeah, that, that's what I said about uh, cardiologues. And uh, I remember when we uh, when syndicate the deals with Spartec, uh, Idinvest, and Corma. Corma was the only uh, healthcare fund investing in, uh, in, uh, in cardiologues. That was a bit of a surprise, but uh, talking to our biotech or medtech colleagues, a SaaS company, they don't know what it is. And for them, you know, a SaaS company is something that has no real asset, no real value, you know, it's only software. We need to bridge uh, these worlds, and that will probably be the case also in the financial industry, I think. There are plenty of, uh, of, of sectors where traditional IT VCs were not active, and will have to uh, be active because the, the, the opportunities are massive. Julien David, you've in invested in chip technology. Um, as regards these uh, financial services, are there any, any trends focused on that? So, specifically on financial, actually, it's quite complicated. In the US, there's been a huge wave of fintech because basically there's credit history. The first thing you have to get when you arrive in the US is a social security number, not to get benefits, like in France, but to be able to get credit. This is how it works. So, first thing is you get data about how you borrowed stuff, how you bought stuff, and that provides a massive amount of data, makes you not, analytically addressable by machine learning. In Europe, we operate differently, so the, the space of fintech for automation exists, mostly driven by actually banks trying to automate more and more their positioning on certain type of products or positioning products towards customers, but this is very early, too early to tell. And I think that banks are so stressed out that they will acquire rapidly anything that provides them with let's say, a competitive edge on intelligence. I tend to agree with Steve that the first trend will be we get so much data these days, and we get more and more usage of algorithmical solutions that the question will be the processing power. So chipset will be key. I was with uh, NVIDIA in Silicon Valley two weeks ago, I've seen their latest GPU. Used to think there was a large space for FPGA, etc. but what they're doing with GPU is crazy. And I think that really the alternative is company like LaGraphCore, Binding Euros, ASIC, TensorFlow, and you need, so I think there's a space like that. There's a second space that uh, relates to what Reza said around regulation. I do believe, contrary to you, that uh, AI will be used to temper things that alter the environment of people. So there will be risk taken. And so the question will be regulation. How do you accept that data manages, because health, I mean, truth is, you get data about health of people. People get sick, truth is, big data can handle that. But indeed, it engages the responsibility of people saying, well, you're sick, you're going to die, you're not going to die. So there's a major question of regulation and how you bring a human element to that change. These are the kind of trends that I personally see. 
Actually, I, I absolutely welcome not being in agreement, but actually I think we are in agreement. My point was more that it's gonna take longer because I actually do believe that um, there's a huge trend and it's one of the reasons we invested in Candelog is that the amount of data and things will make it a very nice market for, for machine learning. It's just gonna take a little bit longer. And on the hardware piece, um, you know, I'm actually pretty excited because it feels like hardware is cool again. For the longest time, everyone thought this is to bed. It's gonna be Taiwanese servers with Intel chips and it's gonna dominate the world. Um, and we are seeing a lot of alternative things, whether people, we did an investment in a company that puts a processor on memory modules. We invested in a company that's bringing a full stack of um, AI optimization for FPGAs because they believe there is an alternative possible to NVIDIA. Um, and so this is becoming interesting to see a whole new pace of innovation in that world. People putting you know, processing power directly on storage so that as you're gathering data on the edge, you can go and do that. So the whole infrastructure to be able to serve these new trends in machine learning, we find pretty interesting and exciting because again, it's gonna open a whole new world of, of hardware investments. And then the other piece is I'm a big believer in cybersecurity because the bad guys are getting meaner and meaner. And the only way to respond to that because of the lack of human analyst talent available is going to be to leverage machine learning modules so that you can learn from the attacks and, and everything that's going on. Um, and so that's definitely a field where I think there's a real pain. People can get fired if the shit hits the fan. So they're gonna spend money and there's an opportunity there. I think it's, health is a very interesting sector. Um, one of the things for the, to think about for the, I was a question from me to the panel really is, in addition to the regulatory obstacles, which I know very well having worked at DeepMind um, for the previous two years before jo joining Atomico, there are not that many examples of real diagnostic breakthroughs driven by AI at the moment in, cl in a clinical setting. There are in imagery, I think we're, we're starting to see that trend really play out in sort of the analysis of imagery. But there was this promise, you know, from for the last five years that we would have, because we had genomes and because we could match histories with genomes and because we could do that at scale in population sets, we could achieve a lot of um, actual clinical breakthroughs. And so far, as well as the regulatory side, those have not really come through yet. Maybe we're just a little bit too early in the cycle. I don't know if you guys, you, you, you've probably done more investments in this space than I have, so you might know more. No, I actually, we, um, you know, just as a consumer living through the whole 23andMe debacle, the regulatory came and basically made the company go a huge step back. So I think that was a huge issue because there were a lot of hopes around how they could help with that. And then you plug it into, you know, self-quantifying tools and, you know, health tools and, and running tools and everything. Uh, but the regulatory piece, the FDA actually stopped that pretty, pretty br dramatically. But uh, about this sector, I think what is interesting again is, uh, is uh, the, the fact that they need s some bridges are needed. At the end of the game, uh, will uh, Abbott or Medtronic or blah, blah, blah be the king of this world or will it be Apple, Amazon, Google? That's a very interesting uh, TV show, I think, <laughs> you know. And, uh, you know, being close to, to the scene is interesting. My sense, you know, because uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, in a, I'm a digital VC, let's say, let's say, let's say things like that, is that probably Apple, Amazon and Google will win at the end of the game, probably. I would say most likely, but it's not certain at all. So that, that's, that's something uh, interesting to really to, to observe. Yeah, I mean, I was at Google before DeepMind, and Google worked on health since 2006 and put a lot of effort in for a long period of time, and so far with not huge results. So um, I, d I always think that actually there is opportunity for the, for the new entrants to disrupt even the very big, well-funded organizations. So I, I, I would probably take the other side of that bet. So you mean the incumbent will survive? Or newcomers will uh, win? I think, uh, I don't think the incumbents are in any danger anytime soon, but specifically in health, I would probably be more on the side of the disruptors than the incumbents, than, than, the, than the FANG incumbents. So. Thank you everybody, I think we are right on time. <laughs>